Welcome to part three of our workers' comp webinar series. In this video, we cover essential topics including transitioning to permanent disability payments, calculating disability ratings, understanding payment structures and durations, and navigating independent medical reviews versus qualified medical evaluators. I encourage you to explore the entire webinar series on the Pacific Workers YouTube channel. There, you'll find valuable insights from part one and two. And be sure to subscribe to updates on future content. Without further ado, let's delve into today's discussions. Whether you're an employer, an employee, or an industry professional, there's something valuable for everyone. Let's get started. Speaking about permanent disability benefits, which is our next topic that we're gonna be diving into, um, Explain a little bit and let's try to help um, injured workers understand a little bit about the permanent disability benefits. What does that look like? And how do you even know you're about to get MMI? How do you get ready for it? There's just so much to dive into. Okay, so permanent disability benefits are different than temporary disability benefits. Temporary disability benefits, like I said, were designed to compensate you for lost wages. So for example, every single year, the maximum temporary disability rate gets adjusted by cost of living, so inflation. So mm -hmm. every single year, temporary disability has gone up. Permanent disability is not designed to compensate you for lost wages. It's designed to compensate you for the functional limitations that you have from an injury. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not you're making $1,000 a week, $3,000 a week, whatever. You get paid the same permanent disability rate as long as within the minimum and maximum, which is much much, much lower. Maximum permanent disability rate right now in California is $290. That has not changed since 2013. So yeah, it's terrible. Please write your state assembly member, you know, go do what you can because it needs to change because quite frankly, it's clearly inadequate. I think cost of living, everything's gone up since 2013. So it's pretty clear that that needs to change. But yeah, the max is 290 per week. Versus the max temporary disability benefit right now, I think is around fifteen hundred per week. So dramatic difference between the two benefits. Let's talk about the impairment ratings. How are these calculated? How does someone, for example, who got injured and healed as much as they could, however, there is just not a hundred percent healing there? How does this rating come into play? So you go see a doctor. Um, it can be your treating physician or it can be a doctor called a qualified medical evaluator. And basically they take your limited function and they give it a percentage of impairment relative to your whole person impairment. So meaning if your perfect functioning body is 100%, right, you may have uh, a leg amputation. And so maybe you have a 40% rating or, you know, you had a total knee replacement as like a 20% rating if you have a good outcome, or maybe you have issues with range of motion in your arm and shoulder, or you have uh, a herniation in your, in your cervical spine. Those are all things that the doctor would give percentage impairment for. That gets adjusted based on your age, your occupation, and generally speaking, what's called a, a diminished future earning capacity. And the whole idea is that running through this formula, you take a percentage and give it an adjustment up or down based on who that person is, what their job was, how old they are and stuff like that. The whole idea being, you know, someone with a, a physical injury, like let's say you're a firefighter and you get your leg chopped off. You're probably not going back to work, especially if maybe you're 50 years old. That's maybe it for you. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to go jump in go back to college and, you know, start over and, you know, redo computer life. science or yeah. something. Yeah, it's just not as, not to say it doesn't happen, you know, but it's, it's certainly less likely than, you know, if I'm 20 years old and I'm a computer scientist and I get my leg chopped off, it doesn't really matter. You know, if I, I can still engineer, I'm still a programmer, I can still type, my mind's in the right place, and hopefully I can still do that job. So it's not as likely that injury would affect me in the same way as it would the firefighter. Right. So that increases or decreases the value of the case. Ultimately. Is that discriminating someone for their age within the workers' <laughs> compensation system? Like, hey, you're getting discriminated because you're older, you're going to get more, or because you're younger and you can redo your life. You're gonna... Yeah, I mean, it, it, with certainty, I can tell you the older you are when you have your injury, the higher the value of the case. Right. 
because it's less likely that you're going to go back to work. That's really the reason why. Wow. Um, at least it's supposed to be. Okay. So, but yeah, uh, permanent disability, it, you can't work at the same time you're getting temporary disability. You can while receiving permanent disability, again, because it's not designed to compensate you for your lost wages. Right. Let's talk about the permanent disability payment structure. What does that look like and what can you tell us about it? So just like temporary disability, it's paid every two weeks. Um, most people are max earners, so it's $580 paid every other week until whatever level of permanent disability you have is paid out. So it's a bit of a, a misnomer. People think permanent disability means I'm going to get permanent benefits for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you, yes, depending on how high your rating is, but you can have you know, a 20 or 30 or 50 or 60% permanent disability, and it doesn't mean you're getting benefits forever, just until that amount is paid out. Yikes. So like, you know, uh, I would have to look at the, the tables again, but like, let's say you had a 60% a rating and that was worth like $120,000, you would get $580 every other week until that $120,000 is paid out. Right. You were mentioning something earlier about the qualified medical evaluators, which is, I'm assuming, another type of doctor that also plays a role in the California workers' compensation system that determines a certain percentage of your body part. And that's the person that essentially ties in the money that you're going to get from your workers' compensation claim. Um, what happens when that person is not your friend, is not being fair, and you need to dispute where do, what options do you have there? So you go to your primary treating physician for your treatment. You go to QMEs, Qualified Medical Evaluators, is an evaluator only. Their sole job is to look at your medical records. They'll do a physical examination for you. And ultimately, they'll write a report detailing their opinions about your particular case. And that includes things like whether or not you had an injury in the first place, what body parts are involved, what your work restrictions are, whether or not you are still temporarily disabled or you've reached maximum medical improvement. And if you have reached maximum medical improvement, what your impairment ratings are. And so they have a, a, a huge amount of power in your workers' compensation case. And so if you end up with the wrong QME and they write you a bad report, it can really be an uphill battle to try and fix the case. And so yeah, it happens a lot where people go to more conservative QMEs who disagree with treating physician and the insurance company will use that to significantly downplay the value of the case or do things like cut off medical treatment. Yikes. Is this any different from independent medical reviews? Yeah, so independent medical review is just limited to whether or not treatment should be authorized. A QME does not have the ability to overturn a utilization review denial, meaning if your treating doctor wants to do a back surgery and they submit a request for authorization and then the request for authorization is denied by utilization review, then you file an independent medical review application and your appeal is denied, you can't go to the QME to overturn the denial. It is what it is, at least for 12 months. Unless Yikes. there's a change in circumstance. Great. Just so great. the QME can weigh in on medical treatment insofar as whether or not the injury caused the need for the medical care or the, 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 con the condition for which the medical care is needed was caused by the work injury. And what I mean by that is you can have, let's say, uh, an, a, a blown out knee and you need a total knee replacement. There's a question about whether the medical treatment is appropriate for that condition. So utilization review addresses that. They say, okay, well, the doctor wants to do, let's say, a, a left arm amputation, but your knee is the injured body part, and that's what they're trying to treat. Utilization review would say, whoa, like, that's, no, it's not happening, right? Like, you're not, we're not cutting off your arm to treat your knee. Yeah. Silly example, but that's what they're really judging. They're looking and saying, is this treatment match up to what's needed to, to fix right. this? That's a good thing. Right. Conceivably. QMEs may weigh in on whether or not, you know, your, your knee was even injured in the first place that necessitates that care. So you may actually have like a blown out knee 
your treating physician could request authorization for a total knee replacement. Utilization review could approve it. Then you could go to a bad QME and the QME could say, no, I don't think the knee was caused by, by work. And so it doesn't matter whether or not you need the knee surgery. It's not happening because your knee is not related to your injury. Wow. So you're, you're looking at two different things. And so the QME won't touch the utilization review stuff, but they will weigh on whether or not your injury was caused by work. There's a lot of information that is given in this webinar here, and I, I hope you're taking all this in. There's just so much to dive into, so many branches that come out of this. We're going to keep moving forward with our next slide. There is another really important sector within the California workers' compensation system that a lot of people, for whatever reason, are not familiar with, and that's a vocational rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, Bilal, what this vocational rehabilitation is, and if it's necessary, does everyone get one? Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, vocational rehabilitation is kind of an old term of art, and it really represents the fact that you know, people have functional limitations and that needs compensation, but also people may be forced out of their employment. And so you have to go back to school, you have to learn something new, like who's going to pay for that, what's covered. And so vocational rehabilitation used to be more robust than it is nowadays. But if you end up having permanent disability and your employer cannot offer you permanent modified work after you've been deemed maximally medically improved within 60 days, then you're entitled to something called a supplemental job displacement voucher. And that's a voucher that's good for up to $6,000 in job retraining. Uh, you can use it within two years of it being served to you. And you can use it for things like uh, laptops or coursework or even you know miscellaneous reimbursement. And the whole idea is that $6,000 is supposed to help you retrain or reeducate yourself. And in addition to that, in California, if you're Injury is after January 1st, 2013, which I mean, pretty much most of the injuries nowadays that we're talking about. Um, right. And you get the voucher, you're entitled to something called the return to work supplement from the state of California. And that's an additional $5,000 payment to you uh, that you can use for whatever you want. It's great to know that you have these services offered if you need to change careers completely because of your injuries or your illness. You're not able to jump back into work and things that you would have known easily because that's what your career has been for your entire life. These services offered is kind of like giving you a second chance to restarting another career that's going to essentially come into play with whatever necessities you need after your injury. A lot of people don't vision not being able to go back to the work they were doing prior because no one ever wants to have a massive injury where it doesn't allow you to go back to the things that you were doing. So knowing that there is services offered and that there is just in general this voucher is very important. Does everyone become eligible for, eligible for this or no? No. So when you've reached maximum medical improvement. Well, let me explain it differently. While you're temporarily disabled, you may have work restrictions, but those work restrictions are going to change, right? Like you yeah. could have a surgery and get better. You could have some time off and feel better, whatever it is, you know, you're, you're good once you've had that time to like heal up a little bit. Once you've reached maximum medical improvement, then your restrictions move from temporary to permanent, at which time your employer has to engage in what's called the good faith interactive process and determine whether or not you know, they can accommodate your work restrictions to the extent they cannot accommodate your work restrictions. Your employer does not need to keep you on. So a lot of people tend to think this is illegal that they say, oh, well, I had work restrictions. So my employer fired me. Right. Which sometimes it's illegal. Don't don't get me yeah. wrong. You know, sometimes the employer doesn't engage in the good faith interactive right. process and it's complete BS. But other times, you know, it's legitimate. Like my my example earlier about losing your leg. If I don't have my legs, I probably can't be a cop. I probably can't be a firefighter. I right. probably can't be a construction worker. There's a lot of limitations on my employment, in which case the employer cannot accommodate me. And it's it, no longer suitable. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's, it sucks. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but they don't have to, you know, basically make up a job or a role for me if it's not something they reasonably could accommodate. So essentially you can be forced out of your work because of work restrictions. And so if the employer doesn't offer you permanent modified work within that 60 days of being maximum medically approved, um, that's when you get the voucher. 
And so not everyone gets that because some people go back to work. Right. <laughs> of course. You know, so. Everyone would love to just jump back into where they left off and not need to change careers. So then that's when it makes sense that you wouldn't essentially be getting a, a voucher. 